The opinions expressed in the following paid program do not necessarily represent those of WJZ AM 1300, CBS Radio, its employees and sponsors. This is the Baltimore Barristers. Every Tuesday night from 7 to 8, the Baltimore Barristers will discuss law and politics, major legal news, both local and national, and detailed changes in the law that could affect you and your family. Now, here's the Baltimore Barristers, Alexander Bush and Stephen Carmenico on CBS Radio 1300. Welcome back. You're listening to CBS Sports Radio, 1300 AM. I'm Steve Carmenico. I'm here with Alex Bush. We are the Baltimore Barristers. Alex and I are practicing Maryland attorneys, opinionated on all things legal and political. If you want to be a part of the show or have a legal question, give us a call at 410-481-1300. You can also leave us a message on the Baltimore Barristers Facebook page or on our website at www.baltimorebarristers.com. Just remember, all information on the show is offered as general legal opinion opinions and does not create an attorney-client relationship. We have a great show, so I want to get right into it. Typically, we do a mix between more legal and uh, political analysis. Last week, we certainly did more of the legal analysis of some of the uh, trials going on in the city, but this week we wanted to turn and, and we're going to get more political tonight. So we have a, a fantastic guest that we are very honored to have on the show. His name is Milo Yiannopoulos. He's an outspoken conservative, writer uh, for Breitbart, and if I might add the uh, scourge of liberals, feminists, and university faculty alike. Steve Milo, are you there? really excited, Milo. Are you, are you with us? I am. Thanks so much for having me. I thought Steve was going to break down and cry if you didn't come on the show tonight. So, Oh, I know, because I let you down last week, didn't I? I'm so sorry. I, I had so much going on with all this crazy college tour, so I'm, I'm glad we made it work. So well, thank you so much for having me. Well, we will definitely want to talk to you about the college tour. For sure. So we were going to last week, we were going to ask you about the Orlando uh, whole massacre, and we're certainly going to get into that tonight. But I wanted to talk to you about the most uh, topic that is on everyone's minds is the the whole Brexit. So we wanted to get your take, someone that that kind of is from from that area and could kind of explain to an American audience of what is going on, because when I'm looking at the, the people that I see on Facebook and the news, it seems like everyone's losing their minds. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, well, everyone's losing their minds uh, on American college campuses, and they have been for some time. What's fascinating about, I guess my tour has been the catalyst for this, but I think it was brewing already anyway, is a sort of libertarian and conservative revolution. And now it's a, a bit like the revolution in the 60s and 70s, you know, the campus radicals um, who were fighting against what they perceived to be, you know, conservative institutions and authoritarian conservative, uh, conservatism and all this kind of stuff. Well, leftists have been running university campuses for really quite a long time. And these places run by liberals, infested by liberals, run according to liberal doctrine, we're now told by liberals are hotbeds of rape and racism and sexism and transphobia. Well, liberals aren't doing a very good job of running their own institutions, obviously. Of course, the reality is they're just insane. Uh, you know, and uh, there's this, this is amazing sort of revolution brewing. And it's led by, um, you know, Young Americans for Liberty and um, Turning Point, the co- various college Republican societies, and people who, you know, maybe some Trump supporters and, and my fans and people who come to my shows demanding uh, of university administrators that they start to once again teach a diversity of political viewpoint. Because for so long, American universities have been obsessed with the mantra of diversity, getting more black students, getting more gay students, getting more women. You know, now the issue has become for many, for many young people going to university, this, these schools are not teaching a diverse and broad range of opinions. And in fact, it's worse than that. They are punishing, penalizing people academically for having the wrong political opinions. That's a reality in today, you know, in America today. It's been a, a huge shock to me as a Brit coming over here to what I thought was free speech central, you know, uh, the United States of America, and seeing this in action. So my tour is designed to embarrass university administrators as much as possible to sh- publicly shame them into doing what they should have been doing the whole time, which is giving students a well-rounded, a broad range of opinions so they can look at the available data and make up their own minds. Well, I think it's it's interesting when you go to a college campus, you see sometimes a lot of stuff is thrown by protesters. And then ultimately, it seems like that uh, the deans have to resign. Faculty have to resign after you go to a college to speak. 
Well, I, of course, don't take any pleasure in anybody losing their job. But it seems to me that um, university administrators have put themselves, and they are completely responsible for their own predicament, they've put themselves into an awkward position. Because on the one hand, they are committed to pandering to Black Lives Matter and to crazy campus feminism, to social justice warriors, to the worst, you know, most evidence-free feelings, grievance, and victimhood-based student politics. They have, they've gone all in on that. And they're, they're you know, making... Uh, making colleges safe spaces, putting trigger warnings on text, pandering to students' elaborate and exaggerated sense of victimhood and their feelings and all this kind of nonsense. So they've committed to that. But on the other hand, they have an academic duty to um, allow other points of view on campus, else what's the point of a university? So when I come down, as I did to DePaul in Chicago, and it creates pandemonium on campus, these kids are just mystified by the idea that a gay man could be a conservative because they just never, they couldn't even imagine such a thing could ever happen because it's just taken as an article of faith that if you're black or a woman or gay, you know, you must believe in a engorged state taking all your money and, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, you know, they're so deep into this identitarian politics, this divisive garbage the left has been pushing for 30 years. It doesn't even occur to them that somebody who falls into one of these supposed victim groups might have a different point of view. This is a catastrophic failure on the part of the university administrators. And they cannot simultaneously defend free speech and open academic intellectual inquiry and pander to social justice warriors. So what do they do? They take the coward's way out and they quit. So let's get into, uh, and for our audience, the whole Brexit thing. To get, let's get a sure. your opinion as someone from Britain. I mean, I didn't follow it that much, uh, to be honest. But when I when I when the vote came down, my just initial thought was, okay, well, it seems like to me there's less government. That's that's a good thing. England is in in more control of their uh, future. So, what's your take on it? Well, nothing to me. I mean, I think the vote is good on its on the merits, in, on its you know in its own right. I think it's good that Europe governs more of itself, has control of its borders to you know to to protect women and minorities from Muslim uh, you know from mass Muslim immigration, which terrifies me as a gay man. You know, after Orlando, God knows what else. You know, I don't want that. You know, I don't want it in my neighbourhoods, and I, I take quite a strong line on this. I know, but you know, the UK, which has always been you know the superior partner in Europe, deserves to have some self determination. Deserves to, to you know to control its own borders and take the power back from Europe. But even though I think it wins, Brexit is right on the merits, and I'm glad that it won, nothing has been quite as delicious, and nothing I haven't enjoyed anything quite as much as watching the entire media and political establishment throw their toys out of the pram, uh, you know, because the, the unwashed, ill-educated proles made the wrong decision, you know? And now you've got pushes from the Labour Party and from certain corners of the media in the UK saying, we need another referendum. People didn't... It's like, yeah, they want a second the, vote. They want a second vote. I mean, this is like Tim Pot Dick tin pot dictator stuff. It's like you keep having another vote until you get the result you want. Well, I'm that's sorry, been the guys. EU's the people, traditional people, thing has been to just keep having referendums till they get the one they want, well, right? This is, what Europe has, this is what Europe has done. Well, they do one of two things. They either completely ignore the result and charge ahead anyway, or they keep having more referendums so the people are eventually like, oh my God, fine. You know, the, 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 out, the, you know, the, the, um, the turnout for these, these things goes down and down and down and down until it's only the, you know, the ideologues that bother to come out and vote and then eventually... They get the result they want. This is not democracy. This is not self-determination. This is not people ruling themselves. This is un unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels, you know, hundreds of whom get paid more than our heads of state, uh, more than our, you know, our prime minister. And nobody knows any of their names. You can't vote for them. You can't vote them out. You know, nobody knows who any of these people are. And these people are responsible for vast, you know, areas of land and huge economies. Well, Britain, and we have a very long, proud tradition of this, and this is why the UK and America has always, have always got on so well together. Um, Britain has a very long, proud history of defying est establishment, of being fiercely independent, of, you know, punching above our weight. Well, you know, I see the, the Brexit result as the people of Britain is uh, reestablishing that national spirit and reaffirming it and reminding the people who run the country, people in academia, people in the media industry, the entertainment industry and politicians, that they do not represent what we believe. They do not represent our views. Um, this has been a very painful reminder for those who rule over us that their priorities are not the priorities of the majority. I just want to remind everyone you're listening to CBS Sports Radio 1300 AM. I'm Steve Carmanico. I'm here with Alex Bush. We are the Baltimore Bears. If you want to be a part of the show, please call in at 410-481-1300. We are talking with Milo Yiannopoulos. So uh, I want to move on to your thoughts on the, the Orlando shooting. I know you've made a uh, sure. uh, uh, many statements about your views, kind of um, what most people would describe as extreme views about Islam. I, I want to 
put that into to context with, with the Orlando shooting for us? Sure. I mean, people say that quite often in interviews. I have extreme views on Islam. But what I prefer to do is simply look at the data. Look at what Muslims say about themselves. Now, everyone in America knows somebody with a Muslim name who is a perfectly nice person. That's not what I'm talking about when I, I say that Islam represents a threat to women, to homosexuals, and to everybody else. It is, you know, it, I, what I want to do, what I want to know as a data-driven, evidence-based kind of guy, is how do Muslims themselves describe their social attitudes to other people to, and to our way of life? Well, let's look at the data. And this is not, you know, crazy right-wing conspiratorial internet surveys. This is pure global data. This is Gallup polls. These are, you know, gold standard measurements that are used. And we discover that 100% of British Muslims, not Muslims in Raqqa or, you know, in Damascus, 100% of British Muslims think that homosexuality is an unacceptable lifestyle choice. Over half of them want it made illegal. 39% of them believe that a woman should always obey her husband. 25% of them believe that Sharia law should come in in the UK. Now, this is not... It, to my mind, as a gay person watching Orlando happen, this is not, you know, the response of a community that these are not the answers, the poll answers from a community that can engage well with modernity, with modern Western liberal democracy. It is profoundly antithetical to the, uh, you know, values of tolerance that we celebrate and that we are just justly proud of in the West. And this is not, I just got to underscore this for listeners who find some of my statements about Islam to be over the top. This is not terrorists. This is not Islamism. This is not ISIS. This is ordinary Muslims who live two streets away from you. 100% of the Muslims polled in Britain believe that homosexuality was an unacceptable lifestyle choice. Now, you can, uh, many of your listeners will have, will have some sympathy with that view because they're Christians or whatever, right? But this is, this is a religion defined by its intolerance. This is a religion characterized by violent reactions to all of the things that make the West great. Whether it is free speech, the right to offend, whether it is um, democracy, whether it is rights for women and minorities, any of the things that have made Western society successful and great and a nice place to live, any of the things on which America is founded, the greatest country in the world, any of the things that have made the democratic West the place everybody wants to go, Islam is profoundly antithetical to all of those things. And my view, having looked at the data and the evidence, and considering the fact that I am gay and I'd quite like to live, I don't want to hear. I guess, I guess my response to that every time I hear that, you know, when people bring up and, and point that out is, is the question is, then why do we just ignore it here in America? I mean, what is your take on that? Some of that can have an outsider opinion. Why do you have when you have two political parties or two groups of people, one that says we're going to support multiculturalism, we're going to let people into this country, um, no matter what their views are, that any kind of intolerance is not going to be accepted. And then on the other side, you might have more traditional conservatives, libertarians or, or, or Republicans that might say, look, we are all for uh, you know making this country stronger and allowing people to enjoy freedom. We might not agree with uh, allowing homosexuals to be married, but we certainly are going to resist and 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 fight. And and people like myself would be almost willing to would be willing to die to protect our way of life here from people that would want to come over and shoot up people in a club that are simply in, enjoying and experiencing the freedoms of this country. But then I'm looked at, at sometimes as oh, well, you don't support uh, gay marriage, so that, that you're unacceptable. I, I can't be friends with you. There is a particularly stupid woman, a um, lesbian, uh, Jewish lesbian called Sally Cohn, who pops up on CNN. She's hired by CNN to say, say dumb things. And she is probably the dumbest woman in America. And she, um, you know, she will draw these kinds of equivalences that you're making, saying, you know, oh, well, what about Christian tolerance? What about Christian terrorism? You know, she doesn't quite use that phrase, but she'll say things like, well, my, you know, conservative, conservative Christians I know are far worse to me than my moderate Muslim friends. This is ridiculous. Is there any equivalence? Is any sensible person sitting at home? And let's think about the voters. Let's think about readers. Let's think about people at home. Does any sensible person at home believe that declining to bake a wedding cake for a pair of lesbians is in any way remotely comparable to taking uh, weaponry and killing 50 people and maiming another 50. The lack of perspective from the political left on this is so insane that it can only be explained, um, you know, 
with it can only really be understood if you appreciate what's going on behind the scenes. Now, the reason that the left panders to Islam, the reason that social justice warriors and feminists, despite the fact that you know you want to see a real patriarchy, go to any Islamic country you like. Certainly, um, but, but feminists over here are obsessed with you know straight white men and their microaggressions and man spreading. It's, it's pathetic. It's ridiculous. The reason this lack of perspective happens is not because they're you know they have strange, twisted, contorted logical positions, though they do. It's not because they set minorities against each other and get themselves into knots, as though that happens too. The reason is that the far left, the social justice warriors, Black Lives Matter, feminists, and some bits of the Democratic Party don't like the West very much. They have some of the same criticisms of modern Western liberal democracy that Islam has. And they kind of agree on these things. And, you know, in the... In the in the Soviet era, when leftists in America were called useful idiots, well, something of the same is happening today, but on a culture, on cultural front. Feminists and Black Lives Matter and social justice warriors on campus are ISIS's best friend. They're providing safe spaces for killers with no gun, you know, with gun-free zones. Well, they're uh, the they're cities. the new Puritans. I mean, at some of the, well, your, they, your well, events, are, look at what it looks like they need a fainting want. fainting couch or something. The way they're reacting to you, I mean, it seems very Victorian almost. It is, and look at the world that these people want. Black Lives Matter wants a world of segregation. It's asking for black-only dorms and black-only professors and black-only uh, support staff in universities. They want a segregated world just like the KKK. Feminists are asking, you know, women to cover up. You know, they want, you know, they hate sexuality, incredibly sex negative. They want to police and, and you know, and, and, and get themselves involved in people's sex lives and, you know, all this kind of stuff, just like Islam. You know, these, the, it's a Well, the mayor of, in London is, is taking off all the billboards out in, out on the streets exa- and now exactly, they can't show. Exactly, and he's doing it in the name of feminism, but, um, well, there might be another dimension at play here because as soon as he was elected, he started holding rallies about Brexit where the women had to wear hijabs and stand at the back. It's very strange. He went, he went, to, he went to speak. This is the mayor of London. And he, just, he declared himself, by the way. He said, I am the West. He said, I'm a Muslim living in London, Labour politician. I was elected mayor of London. I am the West. In this kind of nasty, defiant, triumphalist way. And it sort of felt to everyone else like he was kind of rubbing it in a little bit. And what does he do with that power? What does he do with the responsibility placed in him you know, by the voters? He goes out and talks in a Muslim area and is perfectly happy with um, speaking to a crowd where the women are forced to, st- to, are forced to wear headscarves and stand at the back. And the men, and the men are at the front. This is not good. This is not good. And this gender segregation, that's what feminists want. So this is why these people hook up. This is why they, they, uh, you know, they like each other so much. They basically want a world that doesn't look that dissimilar. And they have many of the same criticisms about Western capitalist democracies. But here's the thing. It is Western capitalist democracy. And it is the system, you know, the, the basis on which America was founded and the system that we have in the left, in the West, rather which has provided all of the advances for minorities that the left claims victory for itself over. It's the market that wants women to be in the workplace because it appreciates that, you know, that more value can be created there. It is, you know, free, free speech and, and tolerant Western liberal democracies that have given gay people rights. And they don't have them elsewhere in the world. They have them in America and in Europe. Why? Because we have capitalism, because we have free speech, because we have, you know, tolerance, property rights, all of the things that make, you know, our bit of the world the best bit of the world. Now, well, our bit of the world is the best bit of the world because we treat everybody nicely. We treat everybody with respect. We treat everybody, you know, we give everybody the, you know, the same rights everybody else has. Now, now Milo, we're going to have to go to a, a, a quick break. Can you uh, hang around onto the other side so we can continue this conversation? I would be very happy to. All right, thank you. We will be back more with Milo Annapolis after a brief profit timeout. Welcome back to the Baltimore Barristers, a weekly discussion of law, politics, and legal news every Tuesday night from 7 to 8. Got a question or a comment? Call 410-481-1300 and let us know what's on your mind. Now, once again, here's the Baltimore Barristers, Alexander Bush and Stephen Carmenico on CBS Radio 1300. Welcome back. You're here with the Baltimore Barristers. I'm Steve Carmenico. I'm here with Alex Bush. If you want to be a part of the show or have a legal question, give us a call at 410-481-1300. You can also leave us a message on the Baltimore Barristers Facebook page or on our website at www.baltimorebarristers.com. We are speaking here with Milo Yiannopoulos. Milo, you still there? Yep, I am. Thank you so much for having me. So, Milo, uh, this is Alex, by the way. Uh, my job, I guess, on the show is to provide maybe a little bit of the, the nuance. So here here's my question. You sure. talked about... Uh, you know, polling data, reputable sources about social views of, of uh, British Muslims. And I think you make a, uh, an interesting point there. I guess my question is, do you think the problem is 
that too many Muslims take their religion too seriously in the way Christians might have done during the, you know, 30 years war in Europe, fighting wars of religion? Or do you think the problem is inherent to Islam? Well, I think the answer is both. Uh, it's certainly true that um, Islam, you know, Muslims are waging war in the name of their religion in a way that Christians used to, um, because Islam hasn't had its enlightenment yet. Um, it may be incapable of having that for a reason, too, which is that, yes, indeed, there are structural problems with Islam. This is a question you always get asked by people who want to try and catch you out. I'm not saying you're going to do I'm not saying you're attempting to do that. But, but um, you know, liberal hosts always try to do this. Like, oh, you think it's a structural problem with Islam? Oh, so you're an Islamophobe. No. Um, and in any case, I think Islamophobia is a nonsense because there are perfectly rational, reasonable reasons for a gay man to be terrified of that belief system. But two, um, I look at it, again, from a scholarly, evidence-based point of view. Um, you know, there are structural problems with Islam. It claims that the... Um, Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith, you know, together represent the final, unalterable, perfect word of God. Unlike Christianity, Christianity doesn't make that claim for itself. No other world religion does. And when you look at, you know, the contradictory phrases in the Quran um, about, you know, peace versus war, you know, jihad, uh, the stuff about jihad, well, there's a principle in Quranic scholarship uh, called abrogation, which means that if, a, if two verses in the Quran conflict with one another, you're supposed to take the one that was revealed to Muhammad latest as superior. Well, the problem is that the latest stuff, the stuff that was, that was uh, so, so supposedly revealed to Muhammad latest, is the bellicose stuff. This is the stuff when he you know, left Medina and become a warlord. So all of the stuff in the Quran about peace, love, and understanding is superseded, overwritten, and nullified by the latest stuff, according to you know, Islam's own scholars. So there are some problems with, with, uh, with Islam. There are some, you know, there's some structural problems. That, I mean, there's a reason, right? There isn't a single world-class university anywhere in the Islamic world. Now you say, well, what do you mean by world-class? Well, where do, is there a single university where anybody travels to from the West to study in, in the Islamic world? No. You know, you have nuclear scientists in Pakistan who believe that the reactors they bought from elsewhere are powered by fairies. They call them jinn. You know, this is not like crazy conspiracy theory stuff. This is just, you know, this, this is how the Islamic world is. And there is a problem there. And this religion has yet to encounter and to deal properly with modernity, with democracy, and with the world as it is today. And there are, you know, there are structural reasons why that religion is... is uh, struggling with that process. What it needs to undergo is its own enlightenment. And every other re major world religion has done this. It's true that Islam is a younger religion than Christianity or Judaism. Maybe, you know, it's to come. But I hope it comes soon, because if it doesn't, we're heading for, you know, a spectacular world conflict, which will make the First and Second World War, you know, combined look like minor skirmishes. Yeah, well, I, mean, this is a we're, we're, I mean, we're suffering because of it. As you said, it hasn't gone through a reformation and, and the, the Western world and, and freedom loving people are, are certainly suffering from it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the, the with with global jihad the way it is, terrorism operating the way it does. This can't be a sort of ranged, pitched battle like the First and Second World Wars were. It's going to be much uglier. And we're going to, you know, we're going to, to suffer far, far worse from this. In my view, Islam needs to be left to get on with it, left to its own devices, and left to do its own thing until it comes to, comes to terms with modernity and decides that it wants to join the rest of the world. Because right now, you know, inter our interventionist foreign policy, you know, as far as it goes, is okay. You know, we need to protect ourselves. We need to neutralize threats. Um, there have certainly been some incursions into other countries that I wish America hadn't made, but whatever. Uh, right now, I think our priority should be protecting our home countries. We can't do that. Look at 9-11, right? America can't protect its own soil. What the hell is it doing, you know, in far-flung countries? This is, a, you know, this is something that we have to look at. This is a domestic policy thing, right? Um, and, and to my mind... I don't have a problem with profiling, which I know is, is, is a, a terrible thing on the left. But, you know, if, you, if you're there in a car accident and you see a BMW speeding away from the scene of the crime, you don't stop a Mercedes, right? Um, yeah, I'm perfectly in favor of profiling. I am perfectly in favor of something Donald Trump has sort of suggested and then unsuggested, which is a total ban on Muslim immigration. I want that. As a gay person, I want that. America is the best country in the world. It has its pick of immigrants from anywhere you choose to mention. You know, everybody wants to come to America, everywhere in the world. Why take them if you don't have to? Well, Why I, take anyone if you don't have to? And, and I think that's you know where we. I would definitely agree with you. When I when I have a lot of conversations with people, they, they seem to reject the idea that you can just not allow people to come to the country. And, and my point is, of well, course of can. course you can because because we have our own self interest 
on ma- and having this country be the best it can be, and why can't any country decide who gets to come to their shores or not? And this is not academic. This is not in theory. Other countries do exactly that. Singapore does it. You know, Hong, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong, these little states in Asia do it. Why can't America? Australia does it. Australia has a great system. Australian points-based system, basically, what the government does is it looks out on the economy every year. I mean, it says, right, well, we're, we're short on doctors. So if you're a doctor and you want to come to Australia and pay taxes and be a nice law-abiding citizen, we've got 30,000 places for doctors. The door is open. Come it seems. It us. seems. Per- if, we, if we want you, we'll take you. It seems perfectly reasonable for a country to say, "Okay, who is going to make this country better? We want those people in." If you're not going to make this country better, then, uh, well, how is, too bad. How is, that e- how is that even a controversial proposition? I don't get it. Like, where? Do, how did we get to the stage where we believe that everybody in the world has a right to be in our country, to use our resources, to be in our communities, irrespective of how profoundly hostile they are to our values? How did we even get to a position? Where where it's sort of borderline racist to be against immigration. How did we get there? That's it's mad. It's very bizarre. But you brought up Donald Trump, and we certainly wanted to get your opinions on him. I know you affectionately call Donald Trump <laughs> daddy. Could you? I do. I do. I do. And I, I heard a very funny clip with you talking about um, your your fantasy would be to be uh, Donald Trump's press secretary. Oh, well, people, people say I should be it, and I, I, don't, I don't know if there's very much chance of that happening because I'm too much of a, a tearaway horror uh, and too, too, too naughty and too mischievous. But then again, he seems to like people like that. Uh, it's some things that my fans came up with, really, but um, I, I certainly would love to uh, at, least, at least talk about it. I think he is – look – you can disagree with Trump on any particular issue. I happen to agree with him on the wall. I happen to agree with him on trade, I think, mostly. I happen to agree with him on the Islamic issue when he's on message. <laughs> I mean, uh, but the overall effect of Donald Trump, for me, actually, again, is social, it's cultural. I think this is the first election that's being fought culturally and socially rather than economically. I think there are, there's reason to suppose that this election is sort of men v. women. You know, Hillary as the perfect uh, embodiment of the establishment feminism um, that has run rampant in American society, e- even in corporations, you know, that sort of fact-free victimhood blaming grievance culture feminism. She's a perfect example of that. Trump as the embodiment of the masculine virtues, you know, of, of uh, strength and, and, and sometimes blusteriness, but, but you know, projecting, projecting an aura of, of certitude and, and trust and faith and strength. You know, I think this is, there's a reason to suppose this is a man v. women election. It's also, you know, it's also a sort of election for America's soul, really, because it's being fought not so much on different economic models of the world, because we don't know what either of the candidates, you know, economic uh, beliefs are really. Neither and and they do that know. intentionally because it's yeah, hard to do, pick at they them. They do. <laughs> this is really a cultural election. And this is an election for me very much about as a, as a journalist and a writer, author and a speaker. What I care about is um, America's intellectual trajectory. And I see on college campuses, on this college tour, a gigantic risk to America's stature and reputation as the capital of freedom, as, as the world capital of freedom. There's something profoundly antithetical to freedom and to freedom of speech on American campuses. And it's, you know, freedom, the, the priority of freedom of speech in the Second Amendment is being replaced by the need for safe spaces and trigger warnings, all this kind of stuff. is garbage, which is not based in science or anything else. It's just based in, you know, in, in this sort of flatulent, feelings-based, lazy uh, uh, entitlement culture. Okay, There's I want. I want to very follow. Very dangerous uh, happening on. on just, just sorry, I'll just finish very quickly. There's something very dangerous happening on campuses, and the overall effect of Donald Trump. Even if you don't like most of his policies, even if you don't like him as a human being, the overall effect of Donald Trump, I believe, will be to smash political correctness in America, make it okay to say anything again, and restore America's reputation as the, you know, as the as the capital of, of freedom and free speech. And that's such an essential project, given what's happening on campuses, in the media, how constrained journalists are now. You know, what, they, you can't report facts because your editor's worried about getting fired because some idiot on the internet will say it was racist. You know, this is a very, very serious problem for democracy, for America's intellectual trajectory, and for everything else. And that, I think, comes first, above and beyond, you know, policy differences, above and beyond whether you like the guy or not. I think the overall effect of Trump will be very, very good for America. So I want to follow up on the the importance of uh, free speech. And, uh, you know, I've noticed with... uh some terror, the, the growing trend in Europe, you know, people will just post something on Facebook disagreeing with government's immigration policy. And then an, an hour later, you know, police are at their door, you know, arresting them for, yes. you know, in, inciting, inciting hatred and whatnot. Yes. Uh, and We're very close to that here. 
and I, unfortunately, and, uh, so I find it difficult to, to understand how how people who rightly condemn those kind of policies can defend Trump when he says things about you know how he wants to change libel and slander laws in the U.S. to make it easier uh, to go after journalists. You see. No, but see, this is different. Look, Trump is somebody who has been lied about by journalists his whole life. Well, guess what? So have the rest of us. Look at the, the look at newspapers. Look at the television. They tell lies about half the population, men and most of the population, white people, all the time. They, you know, they, they say that there's a wage gap between men and women. It's not true. No reputable economist takes this seriously. It's like a feminist meme that won't die, that has gone all the way up to the president. It doesn't make sense. It's not true. They talk about rape culture on American college campuses. All this kind of, the press routinely, regularly lies to the American people all day, every day. It lies to their face about them and to them. This is a systematic industry. This is a systemic industry-wide failure. Yeah, that's precisely when the government's supposed to step in. And, and you know, on, on the free speech thing, just because you have First Amendment rights, that doesn't mean you should be free from consequence. If you deliberately, and deliberately is the key word, mendaciously is the word that lawyers would use in this case, if you mendaciously libel somebody. Now, I think the most sensible interpretation of what Donald Trump was saying, and I think what he wants from this, I think what he's getting at, because the way, from the way his statement was phrased, we don't know for sure because he hasn't given any details on this, but how I heard this was he is going to crack down on mendacious libel. Journalists who knowingly print things that are false. Well, about you, you know you can you already can sue people for... Yes, but, yes, but that's, that's a civil thing. But Donald Trump was suggesting that the law should be strengthened to protect people, not just from false statements, but from people who knowingly publish false things. That's a very high bar. It is very difficult to prove mendacious libel, and it very rarely happens, right? He's a very, very high bar. That's all he was saying. And in that, I believe he's right. Europe, and in particular the UK, our, you know, libel laws over there are, are too, uh, too strong. It is too easy to go for journalists just because you didn't like what they had to say about you. And the line between fact and fair comment is too blurred in the UK. And they've made some efforts in the last five years just to, to improve that situation. But in America, I think it might be too lax because I see every day as a part of the industry, journalists knowingly lying to their readers and lying about their readers every day. And if that came with a penalty, I wouldn't be sad about it. Now, I, I want to talk to you now about the, the part you were saying just about journalists making you know broader dishonest statements, broader false statements about cultural issues, social issues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I think it, it's nice to think as a conservative, well, it would be really nice if we could make it illegal for them to do that. But uh, the, the system we're living in, the vast majority of the people I think would be making those decisions would probably be leftists. Wouldn't you just be empowering leftists to punish more people? I mean, the powering the leftists who want to, you know, arrest everyone who denies, you know, human caused global warming. Wouldn't this just be a yeah, weapon? Yeah, that, is a proposed, uh, that is a proposed Democrat. I, party I know. Platform. I know. I'm, I'm yeah. saying that is. That's why, that's why he judiciously picked that example. Uh, it appeared to be from thin air, but it was, in fact, uh, true. I mean, that is exactly what was proposed recently. Um, yeah, I mean, look, this is a libertarian argument, right? The more power you put in the hands of unelected, in this case, legal elites, the more you are letting yourself become a hostage to future fashion, and the more you are allowing yourself to, to be controlled by people that uh, you know over whom you have no, uh, no control. But... Uh, you know, at some point, that's just how the law works. You know, you got to have people who make decisions about whether you know whether somebody did it or not, and you have got to have people who enforce those decisions. In my, to my mind, having slightly stronger penalties for journalists who knowingly tell untruths about whoever it is is no bad thing, uh, and I don't think it tramples on anyone's rights. I don't think it violates anything. And what we've demonstrated, I think, is that social pressure doesn't work over the last 30 years. The press now moves as one voice, conservative press alike in some cases, to tell lies about the wage gap, to tell lies about campus street culture, to tell lies about race, to tell lies about all sorts of things. And it has failed, and the public realizes it's failed. Look at the power of the press and how it has been smashed you know, in this election by Donald Trump. Now, you might say that's the market working is required and no intervention is necessary, and I might be persuaded to that. But you, asked, you started this by asking me, don't you, know, don't you find it troubling what Donald Trump's saying? And the answer is no. I don't find it troubling. I find it entirely reasonable and understandable, and I think most people would be on his side. I still might, in the end, say, you know what? I think, actually, the diminished power of the press to shape elections demonstrated by Donald Trump, you know, the more they try to hate on him, the more successful he gets. Perhaps that's the better. That's the 
system working as intended. That's, we should stick with that, and let's not do this libel thing. But do I find it troubling that he suggested it? No. I, you know, I think, um, uh, I think most, most people in the public, having you know, been on the receiving end of this, however broadly, uh, you know, whether it's reading the wage gap stuff that they know not, is not true or whatever, most people don't like journalists very much, and journalists don't know that yet. They haven't worked that out. Politicians know that nobody likes them, but journalists haven't worked out that nobody likes them much yet. What Donald Trump said, I think, was pretty canny, and I think most people would agree with him. Milo, we're running up on a break. Would you be able to join us on the next segment? Oh, goodness. Let me just, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> well, we appreciate it. We'll be back after a brief profit timeout with more Milo Annapolis. This is the Baltimore Barristers. Every Tuesday night from 7 to 8, the Baltimore Barristers are talking law, politics, major legal news, and taking your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here are the Baltimore Barristers, Alexander Bush and Stephen Carmenico on CBS Radio 1300. Welcome back. You're here with the Baltimore Barristers. I'm Steve Carmenico. I'm here with Alex Bush. If you want to be a part of the show or have a legal question, give us a call at 410-481-1300. You can also leave us a message on the Baltimore Barristers Facebook page or on our website at www.baltimorebarristers.com. We are here speaking with Milo Yiannopoulos. Milo, are you still there? Hi, yes, I am. I appreciate you hanging on to the other side of the break. I know you uh, have limited time. Alex wanted to get in at least one more topic with you here. So, Milo, you were giving an interview, and uh, you mentioned just in passing, uh, which seemed to me like a, a worthwhile topic to dig into on its own. You said once you started to become better known, get some media attention, you found out people were kind of kind of contacting your friends and sort of doing opposition research. And I just found that really interesting. If you could maybe go into more detail, like who are the people who do that? How do they identify people to research and, yeah. and what are they looking for? Well, um, the problem with the, the problem the left has with me at the moment is they can't beat me. They can't use any of the strategies they've used previously with, uh, to discount libertarian or, or conservative speakers by accusing them of being misogynist or sexist or bigots or racist because I am a flamboyantly gay man who likes who likes black guys and never shuts up about it. Um, you, know, they can't you just destroy their whole image. Right. And, you know, this sort of like, you know, this is this is a person who goes in this bucket who must have this particular set of political opinions is the way the left operated for a very long time. And you were sort of treated as a pariah if you didn't fit that mold. So, you know, for me growing up being gay, coming out gay, not so much of a problem, but telling other gay people I was a conservative, that was a problem. So, you know, I, and I think most gay, most gay people uh, will, if they're being honest, uh, recognize that that picture I'm painting. So, you know, the left kind of identitarian Ident, you know, identity-driven politics is starting to crumble away as the world gets more complex and fragmented. People describe themselves in a variety of different ways, and as the minority wars that the left set up, you know, between whether it's gays versus Islam now, or it's trannies v drag queens, or it's blacks versus Hispanics in America, you know, just, just you know, sort of Trump's immigration stuff, which you know would protect blacks from the effects of Hispanics coming in and depressing wages. This way of looking at the world, dividing ourselves up into genders, sexualities, races. The left did that, you know, um, and so, uh, the problem for them is that I don't really fit the kind of easy mold. I'm not the straight white male of, of progressive folklore, so they can't get me on it, any of their usual strategies. And because they've ruled the roost in entertainment and academia for so long, they've sort of forgotten how to argue. They've forgotten how to bring reason and evidence to a debate. So they're very bad at it because all they've done really for the last 30 years is call people names. So I show up to campus and I'll say, you know, well, here's the data. What do you think? And they lose their minds. They can't deal with it. It's like, what is this hate speech? Well, no, it's not hate speech. This is a study. I'm here talking about facts that suggest that what you're telling people is wrong. Where are your facts? What is your argument? Why am I wrong? What have I missed? They can't handle it. They can't deal with it. And because they can't dismiss me like they do most people, they get hopping mad. And this is why you see the spectacularly theatrical protests outside my events, people smearing themselves with blood, you know, trannies coming up and saying, you know, Milo wants me dead. You know, I don't want you dead. I just want you in nicer clothes. You know, <laughs> I, I, this, oh God, it, it was awful. Um, you know, all these sort of ludicrous protesters who look as bonkers as they are because they are just showing up just to express that they don't like hate. Well, yes, 
I get it. Neither do I. Uh, but, you know, how I think we fix the world is a bit different from yours. Is that okay? Their answer is no. So what they're trying to, I, I mean, I don't know, I guess they try and dig up muck on all sorts of people. The problem is I have no shame. You know, I talk extensively and, uh, you know, to most people's minds a little bit too uh, in a detailed manner on Twitter about my sex life and about my you know, personal life and my various, you know, sort of failings and shortcomings and all that kind of stuff. I live very publicly. I live like they live. You know, these feminists kind of oversharing stuff about their vaginas and God knows what else, you know? Oh, I do that too. So they don't really have any of the ammo that they traditionally have on conservatives with me, and they haven't yet found a, a vector of attack that works. Well, I, th- I think... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, they can't beat me in debates. They can't get me as a, as a bigot. They can't dig up any dirt on me because anything they want to say about me, I've said way before and with some good jokes. Um, so, you know, they, they just sort of get frustrated. So there are always people digging around trying to, you know, trying to... Uh, what they try to do, of course, is attack the speaker. This is Saul Alinsky stuff, you know, Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, very old playbook that came out decades ago, teaching the left how to win PR wars. It's out of date now. I should do an update. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is classic Alinsky tactics. You know, you attack the speaker instead of the argument, discredit the speaker as a way of just distracting people from the fact that he's saying something really revolutionary or something that people should listen to. Well, it doesn't work with me. So if you are listening to this and you are a feminist or a social justice warrior or a Black Lives Matter protester or whatever else you are, here's a challenge to you. Come to my events, sit quietly and respectfully, pay, you know, the, the same courtesy and respect. Give the same courtesy and respect to the rest of the audience they give you. And in the Q&A, come with a fact-based question. Come with evidence. Come with data. Come with something real. Rather than storming the stage and stealing the mic and yelling, rather than smearing yourselves with fake blood, rather than, you know, doing this ego-driven theatricality, which just turns everybody at home off and creates Donald Trump voters by their thousands, why not come and actually try to challenge me on something? Because my impression is that you can't because you know you'll lose. Prove me wrong. I think, I'm, still I think, wa- I'm still waiting for the left to prove me wrong. I think that's what enrages them more. And I think they're almost a victim of their own success that as, as these theories that they have had have gotten more mainstream, then science has actually studied it. And when the science gets involved, they're disproven, as you've talked about. You come with facts and they are still stuck in their old playbook of trying to smear you uh, because they think that you're uh, you know, just continuing some patriarchal, uh, outdated Western notions of uh, freedom. Yeah, I mean, it's funny who's fighting for freedom of speech in various different periods in history. You know, it was the left in the 60s and 70s when the conservatives were, you know, when conservatives were the establishment. And they had some good points, you know. Uh, And I've benefited personally from the sexual revolution and from, you know, some of the things that those people fought for very bravely. People were fighting for freedom of speech on behalf of women when women didn't have the vote and couldn't, you know, couldn't, didn't have access to the same institutions as men, didn't have, you know, equal pay and all this kind of stuff. They do have all that stuff now. But there was a time when, you know, women had to go out and fight for freedom of speech to talk about that and then use that freedom of speech to, to change it. Great, noble, wonderful moments in American history, in, in the history of the West. But the people who are fighting for, for free speech now are, without exception, libertarians and conservatives. Why? Well, that's, you know, it's obvious because it's now liberals in control. It's now left-wingers who run academia, who run newspapers, who run, you know, every great institution in the country. They won. They did great. But instead of saying, hey, guys, we fixed the wage gap. Women have got rights now. Gays have got rights now. Gays get married. They're not happy. They're never happy. They still want to, like, twist the knife in. And now they've started to sort of demonize straight white men. And you, see, you get sort of these, these weird, like, bizarro world headlines that just t- they turn off men and women alike, you know, um, just sort of desperately pushing home the advantage and, you know, grinding people's face in the mud triumphantly and all this kind of stuff, which, which just turns people off. You know, they've, they've overstepped their bounds. They have um, got too lazy, complacent, and smug. And as a result, they've forgotten how to make the case for their arguments. And they've forgotten that there is another vision of the world. There is another view on how society should be organized. There is another point of view on the, the good life and how best to live it. That they have spent 30 years calling bigoted and outdated and sexist and racist and homophobic when it is not. And people at home know it is not. And actually, half the population disagrees with them, if not more. They've forgotten that. And so they've forgotten how to argue against it. And they've forgotten how to make the case for their own positions in a constructive uh, and, and, uh, and healthy way and evidence-led, you know, evidence-based way. They've just got into the habit of calling calling people names. You know, well, I want to uh, kind of uh, make a point on that. I, I haven't been 
too worried about, you know, social justice warriors sort of taking over the world in my mind, because it seems like many of them are people who need to be constantly condemning other people, constantly feeling morally superior and pointing out other people's flaws and failings. And it just seems uh, the larger their organizations get, the less contact they'll have with people like you and me who they can condemn. And it's just going to lead to kind of far more infighting, like you see organizations where, you know, they're kicking out the uh, the the gay white men because they're not um, they're not a, a enough of an oppressed group. And, you know, they just yeah, start, no, I understand, I understand the point. I mean, like, I'd love it if you were right. And I, I, hope, I wish that were true. But actually, that infighting is a sign of success on their part, not failure, because they've won. And all, they've, all the only people they've got left to fight are each other. So actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indicator of a sort of, uh, of, a, of a consolidation of power rather than a sign of weakness. Because what it shows is that they haven't got bad guys to fight anymore. So they've got to start getting ever more hysterical about ever smaller things. And they've got to start fighting each other and looking for internal divisions. That's what you do when you're in power. Yeah? That when a political party is in power, it squabbles. When it's in opposition, it unifies and fights the bad guys. And the left is in power, so it's squabbling. So I don't, I don't share your optimism there, really, I have to be honest. And if you don't worry about the impact of social justice warriors, I suggest, you know, I would, I would urge you to pay closer attention to what's happening in culture. Feminists will come and they will say, oh, we don't want to take away your video games. You know, we just want to draw attention to the fact that, you know, some of these depictions of women can be sexist and unhelpful and the rest of it. Meanwhile, Grand Theft Auto is being taken off the shelves at Target in Australia. Uh, you know, retailers are listening to these people more than listening to their own customers. Comic books are going back and retroactively changing the genders and races of people to pander to a tiny band of insane people. And more importantly, more significantly, government policy is being affected by this. Title IX legislation, the famous Dear Colleagues letter, which has tied universities' hands because it invokes their funding, the only thing that university administrators really care about, which is the sound of pocketbooks closing. It has tied, you know, university uh, uh, universities' hands in, you know, almost Almost to, to force them to treat men unfairly. Now, there are all sorts of things that are happening. If you, if you don't care about the influx of social justice wars in public life, I would urge you to think, you know, do you have children? Do you know that has children? Their experience at university is being destroyed by these people because universities are one of the strongholds of social justice. And if you speak to anybody with a sensible head on their shoulders currently enrolled in an American public university, they will tell you just how bad their life is being made by these people. So if you're not too worried about it, I would urge you to look hard. Because underneath all of the frust- you know, many, many of the frustrations in culture and politics and all the things that really matter to us, the preeminent power and the, the most significant pernicious influence behind all of the bad stuff that's happening is progressivism and social justice. And you don't always see it for what it is right at the beginning. You think, well, it's perfectly reasonable. Why shouldn't we ban such and such? But then you realize it's the same names coming up again and again and again. And it's the same organizations coming up again and again and again. It's the same people funding it all. It's the MacArthur Foundation or whatever. You know? Same small, tiny group of insa- insane weirdos getting to, getting to decide what we can read, what video games we can play, what we can see at the movies because they've terrified movie studios into making awful reboots of classics like Ghostbusters, you know, and the only thing the movie has going for it is that it's all chicks. And, of course, the fan reaction to that, which was predictably, why are you forcing this silly political nonsense down our throats, itself gets condemned as misogyny, which provides the left with another round of excuses to say what a terrible, you know, how terrible men are. This is a Kafkaesque cycle that reinforces itself, which has been dreamed up by, you know, these, these, these university professors and gender activists and the left wing press. And I think we have to break out of it. I think we have to stand tall and say to these people, go F yourselves. There's nothing wrong with this. You know, there's nothing wrong with men being men and women being women. There are differences between us, and that's okay. You know, stop being offended by everything. We're not. It's okay to crack a joke. These are basic things that a mature society should instinctively understand. But America doesn't. Why? Because of social justice warriors. So that's why I think it matters. Well, um, I'm so I'm, Alex. You I'm, should worry about I, social justice. Warriors. I am I am chastened and bowed by by your answer. <laughs> so I want to I want to <laughs> give you time to uh, maybe give us a, a, a rundown of the the college campuses you're going to be on and what what your upcoming schedule is going to be for the people who want to smear blood on themselves and show up. Uh, <laughs> but, or or, get I, some, love or them. I love them. <laughs> But be, or show, learn you know. something. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, learning something, I don't have too much. I, I, you know, I, I like to stay humble in my aspirations and expectations. So I don't expect them to come and learn anything, but you know, who knows? Maybe they will. Now, um, 
I'm off to at the moment. The, the university uh, taught, uh, semester is out, so I'm going to be in, at the Republican National Convention. I'm going to be uh, oh, and I'm going to Sweden. Do you know I'm going to Sweden? So um, a I year didn't know ago, that. a year ago, the Swedish authorities, politicians in Sweden, uh, chastised gays because they said that marching through a Muslim area, taking a gay pride march through a Muslim area, was unnecessarily provocative. Because, of course, you know, left-wing administrations these days have Muslims higher up the oppression tables, higher up the, uh, you know, the victimhood pyramid. No matter how many planes they fly into buildings, they're still more vulnerable and victimized than anybody else. So they have them higher up. the you know, any, Anytime there's gays versus Muslims, the Muslims win. And we saw this in Orlando as well with idiots like Sally Khan. So last year, uh, Swedish authorities chastised gays for being uh, a Muslim ghetto. Well, I'm sorry, but the whole purpose of gay pride, which has forgotten what it was for in the recent decades, but the whole purpose of it was to stand defiantly against, against social conservatism, against reactionary, bigoted, backward, medieval ways of thinking. Well, that, to my mind, is exactly what those brave people were doing when they w- wandered through a Muslim area. So I'm going to be leading a gay pride march through the Muslim ghetto in Stockholm uh, uh, at the end of next month, the end of July, uh, which is going to be hugely good fun. And I'm going, to try, I'm going to see if I can get a horse and do it on horseback and have banners and all sorts. It's going to be a fantastic theatrical spectacle. Nobody knows that yet, so don't tell me. I hope you're well armed. I don't know uh, about the gun laws there in Sweden, but I hope you're well armed. I'm guessing guns are probably banned in Sweden. I'll have to take some armor or something, but that's going to be fun. And then in September, my college tour starts again. So we're in the process of routing right now. It's a very, very complex process because well, I'm going to try and fit in 30, 40 schools between, uh, between September and January. So um, there are a couple of firm dates on the website but I would encourage people to sit tight for a couple of weeks and in a couple of weeks we'll be announcing pretty much the whole tour and it is a very extensive tour uh, of I think probably 15 states and lots of big schools we have plenty of opportunity for you to come and see me speak live uh, and it'll be going all around America between September and January so you can check me out on Twitter I'm at Nero like the emperor um, who was great apart from the Christian burning other, other than that he was, he was awesome he was the best emperor uh, and you can look at yonopolis.net and of course as always you can go to breitbart.com slash milo which is all the stuff by and about me. Well, Milo, we want to really thank you for being on the show. And I actually have a one more point. Sorry, Steve. I know you were about to go, but uh, I get on debates. <laughs> we have like three minutes. I get on debates with, with people on, on Facebook. And, you know, on the show, I've used it as a platform to go after SJWs. You might be surprised considering how it sounded like I didn't take them seriously. But uh, <laughs> I find it, uh, I find because I am not a, a supporter of Donald Trump, uh, people who otherwise agree with me on a lot of issues have have labeled me. I believe the term is a cuck, and oh, I'm just yeah. wondering. It's, a, it's an excellent word. W- just just because I'm not a big fan of Trump, uh, I think was. Yes. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think that uh, that term is is helpful at labeling people, and should it be applied to anyone simply because they're not planning on voting for Daddy? Well, I mean, the left has been name-calling for 30 years. You're now telling me the right can't do it for a little bit? And if you don't want to be called a cuck, you should stop being a cuck and you should come over to Trump. I mean, like, you know, are we going to... That's what I right keep telling him. Is the right now, you know, is so so beholden to feelings-based victimology that we can't cope with a bit of internist and name-calling? I like to know. If you, oh, somebody called you a cuck. Oh, boo-hoo. Get over it. <laughs> well, Milo, we are uh, running up on the hard break at the end of the show. I wanted to thank you very much for being on the show. Um, so well. So thank you very much, and uh, you're listening to uh, Miley Annapolis. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.